today's um, webinar, you authorize the Office of the Brooklyn Borough President to use your name and appearance in photos, um, print and digital or other media. Please note that this session will be recorded. Today we have presentation from three dynamic speakers who will talk, to, who will talk with us about the importance of civic engagement. Today's session is being moderated by Michael Muir. Michael is a senior at the School of Classics located in Brooklyn, New York. Michael is also a 2021 NYC MBK Fellow, My Brother's Keeper Fellow, as, as, which is a part of the Obama Foundation. Um, he is a rising philanthropist, poet, and singer. Shortly after his 18th birthday, Michael's first act of civic engagement was to register to vote. Michael is currently researching the intersection with law enforcement and young people with mental health issues. He will present his project in May in honor of Mental Health Awareness Month. Michael loves to use his talent and voice to help his peers get their message across. Before I turn it over to Michael, we will conduct a brief poll on civic engagement. Thank you for attending and we hope you enjoyed. So I've launched the poll, so please um, answer the brief questions that we have in the poll. Um, you can select one answer um, to begin. We have like two, I'll give you guys one more minute. Um, so we will have Michael um, introduce our panelists and I just want, um, the panelists will give their presentations and then we will um, have a question and answer period, but we ask you to put your questions in the chat or um, in the question and answer um, section. And if you have, if you need to, you can raise your hand and then we will um, try to get to you. Thank you and enjoy the event, Michael. Thank you. Welcome everybody. This is the Black History Month show. Today, we'll be discussing civic engagement. You march now, but we will focus on empowering communities to aid in fully achieving our civic responsibility and participation. According to the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning, engagement reports today's young adults are less engaging civic than their predecessors 30 years ago. Civic engagement is making a difference in our community and developing a combination of knowledge, skills, values, and motivation needed to enact change. Civic engagement is considered the foundation of the, our democracy. By being civically engaged, the power is given back to the people who have their say in the world. From electing politicians that, that create policies to impact their lives, to being a well-informed active citizen, there are many reasons why civic engagement is important. Civic engagement is a great way to have an impact in our community, which can range from fighting for animal rights to access quality education, to social justice inequality. And a morally, civically responsible individual recognizes himself or herself as a member or a larger social fabric. Therefore, consider social problems to be at least partly theirs, or will take action when appropriate. Tonight, we will learn ways to be actively engaged with our community. I wanted to thank Marv Marcel from Good Co Bike Club, Anthony Pierre, Deputy Director from the Brooklyn Movement Center, and Katrina Peru from Inspiring Minds. First, we'll start with Antonine Pierre. She's a deputy director from Brooklyn Movement Center. Antonine Central Brooklyn Organization works as an including co-founder, no disrespect, BMC's ab abolitionist and anti-street harassment collective. It's pointing the family of South Heat Vessels, a Crown Heights resident killed by NYPD officers in 2018, reporting BMC and the Police Accountability Coalition. Several citywide campaigns, including defunding the NYPD, passing the Rights to Know Act and Justice for Eric Gardner campaign. Anthony and BMC in 2012 with steady resume in public policy, government relations, and youth leadership development. Her passions for organizing the ground in her Haitian immigrant upbringing in the golden era of New York City and her love for Octavia Butler when she's not trying to move dope people together towards the Afro future, you can find her biking around in native Flatbush with her husband, Jeffrey. So Anthony, thank you, Pierre, take it away. Thank you. It's so weird to hear somebody reading something that you wrote about yourself. I'm like, oh my gosh, who is that person? 
Um, thank you so much for having me. And Michael, it's so awesome that you're like an Obama protege out here. So just thank you for facilitating this panel as well. And much love to Marv and Katrina. It's really great to share space with y'all. And, um, you know, as Michael said, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I've done youth leadership development work. It's really awesome to be here because I realized like, just how important it is to have young people involved in movement work and to have young people saying, hey, we've got the energy to change things and we're gonna be around a lot longer than you all and we need to start making that change. And, and I say that because I started as a young person in doing this work and the, the skills and the experience that I have at this point, um, there's just no way that I would have, you know, I'm 35 years old and I've now had 20 years of organizing experience, right? So I guess I, I just wanna just start by saying that the work that you start to do now, it may seem like it's whatever, I'm just hanging out my friends doing whatever, but it could turn into a career, right? It could turn into a way of life. It could turn into you trying to change the world in the long term. And, you know, a lot of people get involved in organizing because of a crisis like a police killing. So, um, so I know that there are probably some of you who started marching because of what happened with George Floyd uh, this summer. And I know for me, I got involved um, in organizing because I was so angry. And this is back in um, 2000, in the year 2000, I was so angry and I was, uh, I was in high school and the year before, in 1999, Amadou Diallo had been killed by NYPD officers. And for folks who maybe don't know Amadou Diallo's name, Amadou um, was a 23-year-old Ghanaian immigrant. He lived in the Bronx and he was in the vestibule of his apartment building and he was holding a wallet and police officers said that they thought it was a gun. And he was shot at by four police officers. Um, 41 shots were fired at him, 20 shots entered his body. And I remember when I heard this story, I was so angry. And what made me angry were the details of the story. In particular, two of the officers outside fully unloaded their clips, reloaded, and, and continued to fire at Amadou. And, you know, for me, I, I had experienced other police deaths. Like, I remembered, like, Patrick Dorisman, and I remembered the, the brutality of uh, Abner Louima. But this, this was a case for me where I was like, this is dead wrong. And I spent the whole year thinking like, these cops are gonna go to trial. They're gonna get convicted. Like everyone's gonna see this is ridiculous. Like, like how, could cop, how could there be four cops shooting at one unarmed man, two of them reload their clips and we don't realize that that's excessive force. And when those four officers were acquitted, when they had no charges, um, when they, they weren't held, I should say accountable, um, it made me angry. It made me fiery, screaming angry. And it, it just, it, it shattered my trust in the justice system. It shattered my trust in government. It made me feel like, wow, this is something that's really obvious that happened. And it was the first time I really, really felt like the government could be racist, right? And that's a hard thing for a 15 year old to feel like the government could be racist, right? And um, at that point, you know, I, I did what I think a lot of people do. I went to a meeting. Right, like there was, I went to Brooklyn Tech High School, and there was a um, there was a Black Students Awareness Club, and I went to the club, and I went to the meeting, and started talking to some other people that were in some other clubs, and basically I just started organizing, right? Like I just started joining clubs with other people who were angry about stuff, and I didn't necessarily go into police accountability work at that point in time, and so one thing I want to share with you all is that if you are interested in doing organizing work, there's so many avenues, right? Like there's so many ways. It doesn't only have to be like, we need to organize around police accountability. It's, you know, once you really start to understand how the world works, you start to think that you wanna change it, you can change it in terms of healthcare, right? Like we're in a pandemic. There are lots of changes that need to be made. You can change the world in terms of education, right? Like you can be one of the folks who's fighting to make sure that we have comprehensive education that you can get real good black history education in your schools. So I, I, I guess for me, like I knew that I wanted to make the world a better place, but I didn't know exactly how I wanted to do that. So it was really important for me to be able to um, experiment and to try on different roles and to do different things. So, you know, I, I, um, 
started doing, I started working with at, at a youth program, which was the Prospect Park Alliance's Youth Council, which no longer exists. And at the time, you know, I came in as a young person and I wanted to change the world, but I wanted to hang out with my friends, you know, <laughs> like, like part of what kept me there is that I would see my friends at the meetings, right? Like we'd go to the meeting, we'd get some snacks, we would do some cool stuff in the park, right? Um, and and the reason I even bring that up is because the, you know, the movement is about family, right? Like that the work that we're doing is like we're building relationships, we're building a new way to live. It's a way of you know, there is resistance in the movement that is about how we connect with each other, how we love each other, how we break bread together. And that's the kind of stuff that I think you don't really see when you're only seeing the protest parts. And, and even when people see the protest parts, you know, I think people don't always understand the planning that goes into a protest, right? So the work that we do at the Brooklyn Movement Center we're um, we're a community organizing group, and you know when we we call the Brooklyn Movement Center, people will often um, call back back when we used to be in the office and in person. People will call us up and they'd be like, "I want a dance class, I want a yoga class," and we have to let them know like we're not that kind of movement. And the movement that we're doing is we're moving we're moving people. We call it like we're moving the crowd behind what is the vision for the world that we have. How are we gonna all throw down so we can get it? And for BMC, you know, our strategy, uh, and Martine, I see you in the chat. I, I promise I will put my email in. You know, I'm a little, I'm a little busy right now, but I will, I will get, I will get in the chat with my email. Um, I'll take care of it for you, Anthony. <laughs> great. Thank you so much. Um, and you know, I think like the work that BMC does is is very specifically focused on Central Brooklyn. And uh, and for those of you who may not be familiar, Central Brooklyn is Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights. And in, in Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights, our goal is to is to support, oh, you're not disturbing Martine, it's all good. <laughs> is to support and develop leadership and to support and develop black social justice leadership, right? And so so I'm sure there are folks from Central Brooklyn in the room, if you are a Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights person, please, you know, in the chat, let us know. And as a matter of fact, let's just find out what Brooklyn neighborhoods are in the chat. So please like get in the chat and, and shout out your neighborhood. Because for us, we, we you know, Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights are heavily gentrifying neighborhoods. They've been gentrifying for, you know, you could say three decades now, if you really want to start at the root of it. Um, and it, it, it's, it's important that people really understand that Bed-Stuy is the first place that there, there was a real Black neighborhood in Brooklyn, right? Like it is where Black people originally gravitated to. It is where the seat of Black political power is. And so as these neighborhoods have gentrified, it's been important for us to continue to build power and to continue to build and develop the leadership of Black people, right? Like we, we know that gentrification is about erasure. And one of the things that feels so important to not erase, to make sure that we continue to thrive in is leadership, right? And I say that, you know, leadership, people hear leadership and they hear, um, you know, you think of an elected official or you hear leadership and you think of like a person who's talking on a Zoom and trying to, you know, tell you about organizing, right? And for us, leadership is really about your values, right? Like what are, what are your values? What do you, what do you, how do you move in the world? And even most importantly, how do you move in the world in a moment of crisis, right? Like, do you still continue to choose your values? Do you continue to make the tough decisions that need to be made uh, to stay aligned with your values in moments of crisis, right? And, and, and I say that, and it feels so important to really focus on like, how are we continue to stay aligned with our values is because, you know, this world will test us, right? Like people will offer us things, they'll say like, look, you don't need to be a part of that movement. Come take this big fancy job. You'll wear a tie. You'll get paid six figures. Um, do you really care that much about the movement? And it is important for us to constantly choose over and over again the work that we're doing. Now, is it possible to have that job and be a part of the movement? Yes, right? That's just one example. Um, but I think it, it is really important for people to really understand that the work is very much centered around Black leadership. And what do we do with that Black leadership? We build campaigns, right? So that means for us, we work on housing. So we build housing campaigns. We support tenant leaders in being able to push back against their landlords around um, terrible living conditions. 
we do uh, food sovereignty work. So that means that one, we're starting a food co-op and that and a food co-op is a place where people can come together and decide what kind of food is going to be sold in the supermarket and what else do we need besides actual food to support a food system, right? Like, do we have childcare for people so they can shop? Do we have classes so people can learn like what rhubarb is and how to cook it, right? Like, how do we actually support healthy communities around food? Um, so that's housing, food sovereignty, and then community safety. And when people hear community safety, they often think that we mean policing, right? And of course, we do work around police accountability, but our, our work around community safety is not about cops. Right? It is about how do we actually keep ourselves safe in community? How do we make sure that people, if people do harm, that they are held accountable? And how do we make sure that people are as safe as possible all the time? So Michael mentioned that was one of the founding members of um, this, this group in BMC called No Disrespect. And No Disrespect was it operated for five years from 2013 to 2018. And No Disrespect's work was you know, a bunch of black women came together and said, like, we're tired of getting harassed on the street. We grew up with this, right? Like we grew up with cats telling us like, oh, you got that fat butt, or, you know, following us and all this stuff. And we were tired of it. And I have to say it was me and my coworker at the time, her name was Marley Pierre Lewis, Haitians everywhere. And we, we kept going back and forth, like, oh, this is so frustrating. And finally one day I was like, yo, we're organizers. Like, why don't we figure out what to do about this? We're just complaining about it. Like it's par for the course, like it's regular. So we brought together other black women and we brought together folks who weren't black, who were like, look, we're also upset about this and we wanna follow your leadership around this issue. Tell us what to do. And we started organizing and we, you know, it's funny because we were organizing with some other black women um, from the Malcolm X grassroots movement who are also doing this work under the name She's So Dope. And we sat down for a meeting and we were like, okay, what are we gonna do? Like, what are the solutions? How do we solve street harassment? And one of the first things they said, they were like, well, first thing, we got to find solutions that don't include cops. And I remember I was like, what? And I was like, I thought we were just going to call the cops and figure it out. And they were like, no, when we call the cops, it gets very messy. Sometimes we get brought in. Uh, cops don't always make situations more safe. We need to find ways to make the situation safe without police. And that was, that was it. And I was like, all right, well, that makes sense, right? And we started doing this organizing work where we, you know, our, our, our policy here really was that policing harms communities, right? That like, if, you know, Marv, I'm not going to say you're a cat that harasses folks on the street, but as an example, if Marv is harassing folks on the street, Marv is still part of my community. Marv might be my friend's brother, right? If I call the cops, Marv gets picked up. Maybe he can't go to work that night. Maybe he loses his job, right? So we, we're trying to, you know, at BMC, our work really thinks about what is the whole community? How do we find solutions? And it's hard, but how do we find solutions that fit people who are even on different sides of an issue? And that's, that's not easy work, but it is work that ultimately contributes to the building of the community. So we would go out and we would have conversations. We would go to Tompkins. We would go to the, the, um, the basketball court at Tompkins and we would talk to guys and we'd be like, yo, like, what's the deal? Why are you harassing us? And what was really most interesting about those conversations is that we would tell them like, look, we're trying to find solutions outside of policing and no one would ever say, no, 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 the cops need to solve all of our problems. Please call the cops to answer this, you know? And, and I bring that up because, you know, no disrespect was doing abolitionist work before it was cool to be abolitionist. We weren't even calling it abolitionist. You know, we were like, we want solutions outside the police state. And, it was work that was received well by people, right? Because Black people in Black communities understand that calling the cops is not always going to be the best response. Understand that we need to find solutions outside of police because when, you, when we call the cops, it's often a last resort and we don't know which side of the jail bars we're going to be at at the end of the night every time that we call the cops, right? So... Uh, one thing I, I really just want to bring into this is that, you know, I think the work of this community organizes this work of getting off the street and getting into um, formations where we can solve problems. It is about dreaming up new solutions. It is about saying, this is the world that we want. This is the place that we're trying to get to. And we're going to have to come up with some really interesting ways to get there, right? Like, it's not going to be just some basic up and down, like, okay, we're ready 
you know, like we're going to look in a book and find the solution. Um, and, and, you know, as you're thinking about, okay, I want to, you know, maybe I don't want a career in organizing, but I do want to organize. One thing, you know, the movement needs everybody, right? Like the movement needs organizers. But if you think back to um, those protests, the movement needs project planners. The movement needs sound engineers. The move, movement needs safety teams, right? The movement needs medics. The movement needs lawyers, right? So we tend to think about organizing and movement about like, okay, we need to, uh, like I need to become an organizer and becoming an organizer in 2021 means something very different than it meant for me in 2000 when I was angry about Amadou Diallo, right? What it means for us to move forward, it means for people to start to see themselves in the movement and to understand that the movement is not about people like me going off somewhere and coming up some, with some plans and telling you what to do. The movement is about people like me talking to y'all about what is it that we're trying to do together? What is it about Black Brooklyn that we wanna keep, that we wanna hold on to, that we want to make sure it exists in the future? And it is about planning, right? Like I think that people often look at organizers and think that like we're just fighting all the time and we're angry all the time. And you know, we're angry a lot, right? But our work is not necessarily to be angry. Our work is to come up with what is that Black future that we're moving towards? And then to sit down and plan, like, how are we going to get there? What are the policies that are going to get us to a Black future where, where Black people are loved, where Black people can live safely, where Black people can live and know that they're going to have affordable housing, that they're going to have fresh food, that they're going to be safe around their neighbors and their families. This is, this is the work. And these are the things that I, I, I wanted so much for my remarks to really focus on, like, the things that you don't see when you go to the protest is how the protest is made and ultimately what the protest is for, right? Because protesting is not, you don't protest for the sake of protest, right? Like protesting um, that is principled protesting has a target, has a very clear person that we're trying to move, that a behavior that we're trying to change and that our organizing is disciplined around how we use protest as a tool, that the protest is not the party, Right, like the protest is a tool so that we can get things done in a campaign. It's actually, it's one stage. It's not, it's not the end, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna close here because I do have to leave a little bit early and I wanted to take uh, questions. And I'm so sorry, Cindy, I was supposed to tell people to put questions in the chat. So I'm gonna keep talking so that if you have questions, you have a moment to actually write them down and put them in the chat because I'd be really happy to answer them. I think I have maybe three or four minutes left on my. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay for not telling them to put question in, but I think Michael may have a question for you. Oh, great. Um, yeah. And someone actually asked, where are you planning to open your food co-op? Oh, that is a, doing a lot of food um, justice and a lot of work in food justice um, here at Brooklyn Borough Hall. So that would be great for us. To yeah. Know. So that is a question that is in development right now. So we actually, we just started our store opening committee. And the thing is, people don't understand it, that like, you know, a food co-op, it takes years to organize. We started organizing this food co-op back in 2013, and we now have hundreds of members and the ability to actually open the food co-op. So we'll keep you posted. It's going to be in central Brooklyn. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Um, so so if I wanted to, Antonine, if, if the person that asked about that, but they want to be interested in, uh, let's say, being a part of the development of the food co-op, how would they go about? I've put your um, your email in there in the chat. But just to know, how would we go about trying to be a part of that organizing? Yep, you could go to our website, and I just put uh, I just put it in the chat. Okay. All right. Yeah. Michael, you have a question? Yeah, I had a question. Um, I just want to say, um, Miss Pierre, that your work is amazing. The passion you have for it is amazing. Um, my question for you is. How would you explain civic participation to like a younger audience or younger students who want to, who haven't like really been, how can I say this, expressed to it as much? Yeah, definitely. Well, one thing I would say is, look, you got to go beyond civic participation. 
participation, okay? If you want to participate civically, you could go vote and that could be the end of it, right? And I think that some of what, why people are often so disappointed with voting is that voting is literally the least you could do, right? And if you really want to make a change, I love these questions because it was like, your community board, are you involved, right? Are you, are you asking your, your legislative elected officials, so city council member, your assembly member, your state assembly member, your state senator, what bills, what bills are they writing? What do they mean, right? I think like, if we think about um, participating in government as, as more than participation, right? If we can, if we can think about what, what would the government look like if more voices were there, it has to be more than things like voting. It has to be pushing our government officials to do more for people. So what do you hope to achieve through your civic engagement to all that you do? Yeah, I, I, want, I want more people like you. I want more people <laughs> like you engaged in the movement, yeah? Because Here's the thing. I have I have lots of ideas. I have no shortage of ideas. I can always bring up something that I'm like, this is a cool idea. We should work on it. But at the end of the day, I'm not I'm not Bed Stuy and Crown Heights. I'm not the whole community. And if we actually want the community, the entire neighborhoods of Bed Stuy and Crown Heights, to be to work for the people who live there, then the people who live there need to be the ones saying, this is what needs to happen. This is what how things need to change so that I can continue to live here. Well, thank you, Ms. Pierre. We have VP, um, he's on with us right now. Um, so I know, Anthony, you do have a, a hard stop. So I'm gonna pin the BP because um, he also has a, a time crunch right now. So thank you for joining us, BP. And we're just talking about different ways to be civically involved and Antonine was talking about her work at the Brooklyn Movement Center. Thank you, thank you all as we engage in this very real conversation. Uh, I think it's important uh, to just reflect on where we are at the time and the, and the natural uh, evolution. Uh, I think about sitting in a room and having a person that was sitting in the room uh, tell the elders who were there they said, get out of our way. You don't know what we're going through and you don't know how to move this forward. Uh, we know what to do at this time. And I got up, I rolled up a piece of paper into what I call a baton and I dropped to one knee and I handed the baton to the elders that were there. This was 42 years ago when I was 18 sitting inside the movement when Arthur Miller was killed by a police officer from a choco. Because I fully understood that we all are going to run our mile uh, and we don't run it forever. And there's going to come a day when young people are going to have to turn the baton over to the next generation. And the only thing you can ask for is that process is done with dignity and respect for those who have ran the mile. Now Turner ran his mile and he handed the baton over to Harriet Tubman. She ran her mile. She handed it over to Marcus Garvey. He ran his mile. He handed it over to Dr. King and Malcolm X. They ran their mile and they handed it over to Reverend Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, A. Philip Randolph. They did their mile and handed it off to Obama. Obama handed it off to our Vice President Harris, and so on and so forth. All I'm going to do is run my mile and encourage young people not to sit on the sidelines or in the bleachers watching the race, but to get on the field, feel the burning pain of running until you are exhausted, be able to say that you gave your commitment and dedication not to be frustrated because things didn't go the way they should have on the first try, but that you're going to be committed and be able to say that I gave it my all. And that's what we are when we talk about Black History Month. It's about reflecting on the people who have successfully ran the mile. And I don't care who it is. They will tell you about their good days, their bad days. They will tell you the days where the, when the crowd cheered and they'll tell you the days when the crowd cheered. 
if Dr. King was here, he would tell you about the day that he was in Harlem and a woman plunged a letter opener into his chest. If other great leaders were here, they would tell you about the moments that they did their all and it was not enough. And that's what leadership and running that mile is about. And I encourage them as we talk about civic engagement, to talk about Black Lives Mattering in a real way. Not only don't we want police officers to put their knee on their, our necks, but we want a healthcare system where Black women are not dying 12 times the rates as white women from maternal morbidity. We want an educational system where 65% of Black children are not reaching, prof reaching proficiency in school and with 30% of men and women are at Rikers Island because they're dyslexic and 80% don't have a high school diploma or equivalency diploma. We want fair jobs, proper housing, and we wanna make sure that we have everything from technology in all of our communities so we can access the super highway of the internet. And so this is a great opportunity to say, we are going to run our mile the way those who ran before us did their job. And so when we turn over our baton, we can turn over with the real feeling that we gave it our all. And it doesn't mean that the race ends when we turn over the baton. That's not our obligation or our job. Our job is simply run your mile to the best of your ability. I'm running, I'm running. And I'm happy as hell that I'm in the race and I'm not just watching the race. And so thank you for being panelists and thank you for participating as we celebrate a Black History Month. And then we go into the next 11 months showing people what we learned from our history and how we're going to be successful no matter what people try to do to us. Thank you again. Thank you, BP, and thank you for teaching us how to run our mile. We are enjoying um, running behind you so we can take that baton when you're done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Book and Bird President Adams. It's great to see you again, man. Thank you so much. So now, after hearing those two amazing panelists, we'll be hearing from our next panelist, Marv Marcel from Good Code Bike. Good Code Bike Club began in Brooklyn, New York, when founder Drew Bennett wanted to take a local ride with his friends to instill a sense of normalcy during COVID, pan COVID pandemic. Beginning with only 17 people on the first ride, the club was officially established in June 2020, during the height of social unrest in America. Today, Good Code Black Club has fostered a community of members within the atmosphere of using a joy of cycling as a catalyst to bridge the Black inner city community. They aim to be a platform that promotes safety, inclusivity, and positivity positivity for all riders while also creating physical and digital connections with local community. Through policy and brand partnership alliances, GCBC puts the community first and strives to do a pillar to change the narrative of cycling. So now introducing Mark Marcel. Take it away, Mia. Thank you, Michael, for that introduction. As Michael mentioned, I'm the Chief Creative Officer of Good Code Bike Club. And I'd like to thank everyone first and foremost um, for joining us for this discussion around civic engagement. It's definitely an important one. And um, before I delve deeper into the line of work that we do, I would like to play a video that kind of encaps encapsulates all the work that we do um, in terms of a, a cycling lifestyle brand uh, club. We cool bike club, who are we? We are a black owned operated lifestyle brand based in Brooklyn, New York. Based in Brooklyn, yes, but representative of the five boroughs, New York State, and the world. We're a community mainly comprised of black and brown individuals who are passionate about social and political change, wellness, fun, and of course, being around good company. We're supporters of black and minority-owned business and believe in community economics. We're cycle enthusiasts who we'll support change to city infrastructure that will improve alternate means of transportation and environmental sustainability, aka more lanes and access to cycle resources. Good Code Bike Club was founded in June 2020 at the height of a global pandemic and civil unrest around the country. Hi. 
It's with that same vigor that our members and weekly riders took to their bikes, seeking a temporary escape from reality. What they found was an emotionally stimulating, physically invigorating, fun, and freeing social experience. Our riders have found new friends, family, and cycle enthusiasts to explore the city and created unforgettable memories. Having 200 official vehicle members and engaging thousands of unique riders only over the span of seven months, we're ready to take things to a new level in 2021. Good Call is more than a cycle club. At its core, we are all united around our love for cycling. What keeps us going is our commitment for cycle advocacy, supporting local businesses, and overall mental and physical wellness. Thank you for playing that. And um, if you want to rewatch it, it's available on our YouTube channel as well as our website and our social media. I think you have to pause the next video. Good job. Andrew Bennett here. Also, one of the founder and CEO of the Cool Bike Club. First and foremost, I've got a big thing. Sorry about that. No, that's all right. Um, thank you for playing that. And basically, in short, that was a summary of like what we are as a bike club. But um, to delve deeper, you know, our mission, we were created to um, bridge the black community, right, and engage cycle enthusiasts citywide. And we were able to do that in such a short amount of time It's one of the most organic things that you know, I've ever been a part of. If you would ask me last year, like, would I be speaking to you guys about civic engagement and be one of the founding members or one of the partners within Good Co Bike Club? And I probably would have <laughs> asked you if this was a joke. Um, but you know, uh, I I would like to thank you know Drew for having the vision and um, being able to pull the right type of talent to form this um, this amazing club. Shari, Millie, myself and um, believing in placing stock and faith in us. Um, but within seven months, we were able to accomplish so many things um, from having over 200 uh, bike club members officially and having uh, five business partners all located black owned throughout Brooklyn, um, as well as one global brand partner, Schwinn, which we just inked the deal with. So kudos to us and uh, our members for making it happen. Um, as well as uh, we had three staple events, which we were able to uh, partner with the borough president's office, as well as Congresswoman Yvette Clark around raising awareness. And um, the first ride that we ever, our first big ride ever was um, our freedom ride on Juneteenth, where we brought out 1500 riders who were able to celebrate the um, emancipation um, of African-American slaves in the uh, United States. <clears throat> And our census ride, which we partnered with uh, the Congresswoman along with other assembly people to raise awareness around um, possibly being, you know, uh, not counted for or accounted for in the census. So that was uh, two of our major rides. And we had one separately that was called We Bike Two to raise awareness around the um, lack of resources infrastructure wise from a cycling standpoint. Um, and as we navigated the roads, the farther we got into the underserved communities, we would see like the lack of bike lanes um, or just roads in general, just not being repaired. So being able to document shed light on that was definitely an imperative uh, moment for us. Um, you know, there's, there's a list of accomplishments I could rifle off, but the, the number one thing that I think that drives us um, as a board, whenever we get together and like kind of I look back on our accomplishments um, is this like one piece of feedback I'd like to read from you, for you guys um, that we received from one of our members who will remain anonymous. Um, <clears throat> Thus far, I can say Goodco has been the highlight of my year. I couldn't imagine what my mental space would have been without the community provided by Goodco during these quarantine months. I firmly believe biking saves lives. 
I've seen tremendous growth in Good Co. since the beginning as I started riding with them, I believe back in June. With every challenge, this group has risen and above. So I have high expectations and I'm looking forward to continue the ride with Good Co. And that's just one of the many sentiments that we uh, constantly receive from being able to pull people out of, you know, depression or anxiety through all through the common love of cycling, right? Um, our founder, he's been, he's been cycling since a kid. Uh, I started cycling when I was six years old as well. Um, and the thing that I think brought us all together was this, this frustration. I know, um, I'm sorry. Um, I, I remember reading in the, the comments from Katrina that, you know, anger could be used as like a good thing or like a tool that could, you know, help solve issues. And I, I think that's what exactly happened, right? Uh, I know there was a lot of pent up frustration from the the deaths we were experiencing from Ahmaud Arbery to Breonna Taylor to George Floyd in rapid succession. And I just knew in having a healthcare background, um, dealing with the pandemic and having my people be affected the most, I knew there was a, a sense of, you know, hopelessness almost. So I just wanted to tap back into things that uh, I resonated with as a child. So, you know, meeting Shari and meeting Millie um, on our first ride, it was just it's straight out of a, a film, like the way we formed. And um, I guess in closing, I like to, you know, thank our active members because without them, this wouldn't be possible. I wouldn't be able to even be speaking to you guys. Um, I like to thank the e-board once again, I can't thank them enough um, for believing in me and, you know, and having this shared common vision of growing this thing together. And the way we close out everything is uh, let's ride. Thank you so much, Mark. It's a pleasure. I actually have some questions for you. You know, as you were speaking, I thought like, I feel that as like a Gen Zer, would you say? Mm -hmm. um, when you were thinking about like cycling with your friends and you're just trying to find that sense of normalcy and you know, the trying times of the pandemic, how did it help your mental health and just building that community over time? Um, I think, you know, just seeing people be able to, I, we have riders from all age groups, right? But there's always this constant, it's either, someone's super experienced or super beginner, right? So I wouldn't even classify it by like a, you know, you being a Gen Zer or me being a millennial or somebody who's a baby boomer, right? We have it all. <laughs> we have it all. So I think the one thing that brings us together is that this sense of camaraderie um, and this freeing like feeling that you get whenever you're on is just you and your bike and the road ahead of you, right? There's literally nothing else that matters at that moment. And there's a sense of unity that is formed whenever we all get on the bike and we have a common destination that we're getting to, right? And I think that's that's the goal in life in general, generally speaking, is like, how could we get to where we wanna to get to together? And I think that's what helped in terms of my mental health and alleviate a lot of the frustrations I was experiencing. Oh, you're on mute. Oh. Or not. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. So, because I'm a big person of mental health, I'm sorry. I'm just fascinated. No. Um, why did you choose to organize that way in particular? Like I mentioned, it was just it was super organic. Um, I remember purchasing my bike back in May. Like it was something you know I always wanted to get back into. Um, as an adult. Sometimes adult, adulting, you get caught up with all the other things in life that, you know, you just quite can't get to certain hobbies that you might have left in the past a long time ago, right? So being stuck at home, having to work remote, um, I was just, I had this sense of like, I need to get out the house as well as like, I, I needed an outlet to alleviate a lot of the frustration that was pent up, right? And um, so I was really, doing a self-assessment, I was like, what did I enjoy doing? If I wasn't working, you know, if I wasn't working or if I was an adult, what did I really enjoy doing that was freeing? And it was the only really two things. It was uh, sketching. Sketching was been a passion of mine since I was like six as well. And it was cycling, right? It was just one of those things. 
I'm from Canarsie. It was like, that's the thing we did. We rode bikes around the block or, you know, Seaview Park and, and do laps around there and, and come back home. And it was some of the most, you know, exhilarating times of my life. So uh, when I decided uh, to purchase my bike, a mutual friend of Drew and I, uh, Drew and myself, he just randomly threw me in a group me that Drew created. And I remember I met Drew actually on vacation, like the year prior. And um, I was like, oh, okay, this, this seems cool, you know? Um, and he invited us, us to a ride. Then the next time he just threw it on Instagram and I went to that one. And that's pretty much how it formed, you know, like the cycle club. And when we realized we had something was after our Juneteenth ride. Like, you know, we didn't anticipate 1500 people popping on, on bikes and riding down to Coney Island and doing the electric slide and doing all that other good stuff, right? Like we, we didn't envision, we didn't, we planned for 150 and we literally 10 X or, you know, hundred X did. So um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much like how that came about. Thank you. All right. This is my last question. Mm -hmm. What would you say to the younger generation that like still is trying to find their passion? you know, their thing that's going to make them happy, but also help their community as well, you know? What I would tell the younger generation is be as open-minded as possible. Um, what I credit Gen Zers with is how they are able to take, because we as millennials think we're super tech savvy, right? And you guys do it with the blink of an eye. Like from what I was seeing in terms of like, even from like a financial literacy standpoint, right? Um, the use of TikTok to teach people how to invest their money, that, that's like, that's so genius and so simple, right? So um, I think in terms of finding a passion is just keeping that creativity alive and keeping your mind open to all possibilities. Because like I mentioned, I didn't think I would be as involved in my community through using cycling as a conduit for that, you know? So I would just, encourage that they keep an open mind and that, you know, take your story for an, as an example, you know, you, you work, you, you're part of an organization that we revere our former president, um, Barack Obama, like you're part of his organization, you know, and you're, you still got a lot of living to do. So um, I would say like, just be open to everything and sky's the limit. Thank you, Mr. Marcel, so much. Appreciate you on the panel. So I'll be introducing our next panelist from Inspiring Minds, Katrina Peru. Katrina Peru is the founding executive director of Inspiring Minds in New York City. It's a collective that impacts strategists who has created community segments to engage models across several districts in New York since 2003. She had directed programs at Groundwork, Canva, Hamilton Madison House, and has served as a chief program office at Urban Arts Partnership, where they oversaw a program in over 40 schools in New York City and Los Angeles. Katrina has shared her expertise through TED Talks and several statewide and national conferences. Katrina studied arts, education, recreation management at Penn State, completed an extensive leadership program at Columbia Business School, and was recently inducted in the Cleveland Heights Hall of Fame. Thank you. Now I want to introduce Katrina Peru. Thank you, Michael, for that for that intro. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Katrina Peru, as uh, Michael just mentioned. Um, I'm going to share my screen for a second. Here we are. Uh, so before I get started, I just wanted to uh, first share a little bit about um, about who I am because it pretty much informed. Um, my civic engagement, uh, whether I realize it or not, you know, the one cool thing about civic engagement is that most of you are, are already probably doing things um, organically in your life that's very tied to your purpose and who you are and what you're supposed to be doing, even if you don't realize you are. And, um, you know, I was, uh, I was born in Cleveland, Cleveland Heights, Ohio, and my father told me when I was about 12 years old that he didn't have money for me to go to college. And that pretty much I had to figure it out because they used all of the funds on my, on my older siblings. And um, so I knew that young that I was kind of like on my own and trying to figure it out how to get there. 
And um, I was a very good basketball player. And someone told me that, hey, you're really good. You can uh, probably get a basketball scholarship. And I didn't even know what a basketball scholarship was. But once I learned what it was, I made a decision in that moment when I was 12 or 13 years old that that's what I was going to do. Uh, everything, every decision I made all through high school was aligned to how can I get a bas you know, how can I get a basketball scholarship to college? If something didn't align with that, I didn't do it. So I was super focused when I was in high school because I knew that was my only way to be able to uh, to be able to get to college, and I didn't really have time to be be messing around. Um, so four years of college, and I I mastered basketball and track and a few other sports, and I eventually got a full basketball scholarship to Penn State University, and I also had about twenty five other full, full basketball scholarships. I mean, not not basketball scholarships, but full scholarship offers, not just for basketball, but for track. Um, I was also a musician. I played instruments. Um, I was in a marching band. Uh, I, I, I did a lot of things in high school, but because I was utilizing my talents and my abilities and, and trying to make um, my talent uh, work for me at its highest potential, it eventually opened up doors for me. Um, these other images here, uh, there's a lot of people in all these images, but what I really wanted to portray to you guys is that I didn't do it alone. There was always a team of people around me helping me to do everything from my family to the larger community. They were a part of, um, of everything that, that I am today. Uh, this is my teammates. Uh, we made it to the final four. We won two big 10 championships, but that informs my practice today. Every single thing that I do, everyone needs to know their role. We have to have a shared goal. Uh, in sports, our shared goal was to win. Everyone knew their role. Some, you know, you're, if you're a point guard, you know what you're supposed to do. If you're a post player, you know what you're supposed to do. And not only do you know what you're supposed to do, you know what everybody around you is supposed to do too in order to uh, achieve that, that, um, that larger goal. And after um, I stopped playing sports and I went into the real world, I realized that that concept wasn't natural or organic in most spaces. You know, at, at many jobs that I had and many community organization events that I went to, a lot of people weren't clear on what their role was, what their role should be, or how all the roles are common good. Um, this one on the left is, I'm actually in Haiti in that picture. Uh, this one is actually my, probably one of my, my, my favorite pictures because uh, after the earthquake happened in Haiti, um, my ex-husband who uh, is Haitian went there on a medical mission. Uh, he was a physician assistant and um, he went there to support and provide medical treatment to a lot of the, uh, the Haitians there um, who were suffering. And when he came back, he felt like it wasn't enough and there's more that we needed to do. And I proposed this idea of starting a community school there. And it started off as a vision. He kind of laughed at first, but he was like, how are we going to do that? We don't know anyone there. We don't have any resources. Um, but I just hosted a meeting at my house for anyone who wanted to help in Haiti. About five people came, one I didn't know at all. And after I shared my vision, she was like, that's an amazing vision. I actually have a school in Haiti with about 300 kids and it's yours. And just like that, I went from not having any resources there to now having 400 kids, three, three to 400 kids in a location. Um, and sometimes it's as simple as that. If you want to do something and you don't know how to start and you don't have the resources, just hosting a, a meeting. You know, you never know who's going to come, who's going to show up and how that can open up the next steps and, and open up doors. Uh, I'm also an artist on the bottom left as a, um, a poster that I, uh, that I published, Succeed in Sports, Lead in Life. I do feel like there's a lot of things that you can actually learn and pick up in sports that apply and transfer into real life, such as how to win, how to lose, how to work as a team, you know, how to, how to work towards shared goals. And on the a, on a, on a bottom right, um, this is actually uh, me at the Apollo Theater. And this is also something that started off as a vision or an idea. In Cleveland, I grew up watching the Apollo and it was a big deal you know, within the black community. And when I moved to New York and I, when I was working at the Urban Arts Foundation, I mean, Urban Arts Par Partnership, I was just like, it would be really awesome to do a culminating event at the Apollo. And it was something that started off with just an idea and then it manifest, manifested into, rea into reality in less than a year. Um, and on the, on the bottom right, those are my children. I'm also a mother. I have a son named Quincy and I have a daughter named Nia. Um, but I wanted to show this slide because every single thing on here started off as a vision. It started off as an idea. And then once I started to act on it and talk about it and share my ideas with others, it started to grow. It started to snowball. It started to open up opportunities, not just for myself, but for a lot of other people. And I feel like that's not something that's just special and unique to me. Every single person on this call, every single young person, anybody who woke up this morning has the same um, potential 
to be able to do that. Um, I don't know if you guys realize, but our mind has superpowers. I, I say that to our young people all the time. Our mind has superpowers, meaning that every single idea, every single thing that you imagine, you can actually do it. It can actually manifest if you actually go through the process. Um, so it starts off with the idea, then you act on it. Most people don't, are afraid to act on, on things when they don't see the full plan from A to Z uh, laid out in front of them. Um, like the young woman said earlier, <clears throat> old things, you have, to, you have to try new things. There's a scripture that says that old wine doesn't fit in new wineskins. And what that means is that the old way of doing things isn't, isn't gonna fit in, in, in a new way of being. Because back then, wine used to be in uh, these things called wineskins. And um, old wine, if you try to put it in a new wineskin, the wineskin would burst because it's not, it's not really set to hold old wine. And after the pandemic, it's like a new wineskin was, was developed. The old way of doing things doesn't always work. So you really have to use your imagination and your creativity to try new things if you want to engage people and, and if you want to be successful. So that kind of leads me to this. Uh, your talent will make room for you. So my dad told me that he did not have money for me to uh, go to college. This was the one thing that he told me. Yeah, my dad was a preacher, so he was always uh, uh, sharing scriptures with me, but he said, your talent will make room for you. Um, so as you guys saw from that first slide, uh, all those doors opened because I really learned how to maximize my talents and it paid for my college. It paid for my, um, not only Penn State University, but it paid for Columbia University. I went there too on scholarship. Uh, I never had to pay for school because I learned how to use my talent to create opportunities for me. Um, but this is like an equation that I created to help young people find purpose, which is also tied to civic engagement as well. Um, I put passion first. You know, what are you passionate about? And the reason why I put passion first is because once you start doing this work, once you start getting civically engaged, once you start really diving into your purpose, it's not easy. It's not easy at, at all. And if you're not passionate about it, you're gonna quit. You know, because once you get into your purpose, people are gonna, you're gonna have haters. You're gonna have even more haters. You might not always have the resources that you want, People who you thought was going to help you aren't always the ones who, who aren't always the ones who are going to be there for you, you know. Um, and the passion is what keeps you going. Um, so if you have if you're passionate about something, plus your ability and skills, what do you have the ability and skills to do? You know, some of you guys might be great at drawing, uh, sports. Uh, some of you guys might be great speakers, or if you're charismatic, or you're good at serving people. There's a lot of different skills and abilities out there that um, that any of you guys may may possess. What are you good at? You know, if you're not a good singer, your purpose might not be to sing the national anthem at every game, you know, so you don't want to try to go after things that aren't tied to who you are. And then the last and then the last thing of the equation is what problems do you want to solve? You know, and, and, and when you think about problems you want to solve, what angers you in the world? What do you want to see changed uh, in your community? So, so for me, that's where Inspiring Minds came from. When I did this equation for myself, um, it came out to Inspiring Minds. Uh, the problems that I saw, I'm passionate about my community. I've always have been. I always worked in community organizing since I started um, out of college. Um, I have the ability, skill, ability and skills to build teams and to be a program architect and to bring people together from multiple backgrounds. Um, I, have, I have a skill and ability to raise funds. And the problem that I wanted to solve was that there is a huge disconnect between young people and their, and their overall community. I did a focus group of 40 kids in bed before I before I built my model. And um, one of the things they told me that stood out to me was that they didn't feel connected to their community and they felt all alone as it related to achieving their goals. Then I also um, interviewed people in the community, uh, local youth organizations in the community. And what they said was that they want to connect to young people, but they don't have the resources and the support to be able to get the funds to do it the way that they want to. And they also didn't know how to get into the schools because schools were not approachable. Um, so the model I designed kind of solved all those problems um, where uh, we, I write grants. So my first grant that I wrote, I got $250,000. And then with that money, I was able to subcontract the local organizations within the community. And then we all work together. We all work together as a team to serve, to serve our youth with shared goals. So one organization, um, Sankofa Community Empowerment, they run our rights of passage program. Uh, so I was able to subcontract them. Um, Yay Yay X, they created and designed our civic engagement program. So we were able to subcontract them. And um, in Oceans and Rivers, they developed our, our wellness program and I was able to subcontract them. So now just like that, 
the, the organizations within the community now have resources uh, to be able to serve our youth and come into our schools. And our youth are now connected to all these different organizations uh, through the model that I was able to create. Uh, so for me, that's my purpose. And that's what I've been working on for the past two years. So I'm gonna play this video that kind of shows um, a little bit about who we are. <laughs> about good trouble it's basically just saying that like we're going against those rules that aren't serving us so I think that there's nothing wrong with that and it's called trouble because those people who set in those rules don't want to see us the fact welcome to the program um this is just a reminder um this is a program to teach the youth about be held responsible for how we're brought up and how we're taught and what we're conditioned and programmed to believe. But we can be held responsible for how, if we decide to stay that way or not. You know, a Sankofa analysis empowers us to understand why we're in this condition and it helps us to understand all the power that we have. Your place of change is in how you think about it and what kind of energy you put behind it. That is going to change your response automatically and that is going to change your experience. Literally, I got a scholarship my freshman year for being left-handed and it literally... I never traveled out of this country um, and it wasn't until I got to do that I went to, you know, like 11 different countries around the world. What? Yes. Um, <laughs> and that was, and Duke actually paid for that because I was on financial aid. And one of our questions is, do you believe social justice is an important component to have in your school? So if an educator wants to come up on mute, raise their hand, or just simply drop in the chat, that would be really appreciated conditioning don't nourish your head then you dive into the tub of crime cycle so big though you want to ride you'll never get to sit that's it my storage is empty and i am available to you as someone who do went through your program and still is going through your program i just want to say you're absolutely blessing to a lot of people so especially to me thank you thank you okay guys we're going to get into the the poll questions that we did earlier today i'm going to see you guys the answer and the majority so I, I thank you michael before we launch the poll i just wanted to go back um to katrina and ask her some questions um um, about like her work and the, the young people in terms of the, the civic engagement that they've been doing through your work. Um, um, so one of the questions, sorry. Like how, how, when the young people came to you or, cause I think most of what you do is a virtual space, right? Um, most of your work is through a virtual space right now. Um, yes, since, since the pandemic, yes. Before yeah. the pandemic, we did everything in person. Okay, so what are some of the things virtually that they're doing that you help them to kind of organize in terms of um, civic engagement? How would they go around doing that um, through, a, through their virtual space? So through our civic engagement program, we do host uh, monthly town hall meetings. Mm -hmm. um, so what I do is I, I meet with them and I ask them, about uh, issues that they want solved in their community. And every, every month is something different. You know, at one point it was remote learning. So we hosted a town hall around remote learning and their teachers and educators came and they were able to give their ideas on how they wanna, um, and how, they can, how we can engage more youth through remote learning. Another one was around social justice programs. They didn't have any social justice programs in their schools and they wanted to advocate for that. So they hosted a town hall where they talked about how my program really inspired them and how we need to have more programs like this in their schools. And as a result, we got eighteen thousand dollars from that town hall, you know, and that 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 those funds actually paid for their for their second cycle of programs, which just ended last month. Um, another town hall they did was to raise money for those who needed uh, uh, devices for remote learning and uh, and groceries and and to expand our paid internship program. 
And after that town hall, they raised $17,000 and we were able to do all of those things. Uh, so the, the town hall meetings uh, really is just, you know, this is it's a Zoom link. So the silver lining with Zoom is that just by clicking the link, anybody can come regardless of where they're at. You know, a lot of times when it's a physical space, there's, there's barriers for people being able to get there because of traffic or where they're at. But when we just give everybody the Zoom link, you have all these people now listening to them um, advocate for the things that they want. And every single town hall we, we, we've had, it manifested into them, you know, into whatever it is that they were looking for. Okay. So they would, how would a young person, like, if I, if you wanted to say um, they wanted to be involved in what you're doing, how would they go about doing that? Okay. So um, we are currently doing programs every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday uh, from four o'clock to five thirty. Um, I want to drop a link in the chat because we are having a town hall um, tomorrow, actually, with the MBK, with MBK, and we are launching a campaign called "I Am Connected." And I encourage all of you guys to come to the town hall tomorrow because you will learn how you can um, how you can win money to to run your own service projects in the community. We are going to uh, award um, three twenty five hundred dollar grants uh, to young people to um, to to uh, be able to come up with solutions on how to connect young people during this during the pandemic. Because right now a lot of kids. Um, are isolated. There's been five reported suicides since the pandemic with high school youth in, um, in New York City. So we know that being isolated is a recipe for, for depression. So the challenge is to come up with ideas on how to, uh, on how to connect with your peers. They could be uh, activities, service projects, um, but all, all, this will all be presented tomorrow during tomorrow's town hall. And at the town hall, the application will be released and it's gonna be a shark tank, tank, tank I mean, shark tank style uh, type thing. So once you fill out the application, it's going to be reviewed by by your peers. The top ten applications will be invited back uh, to another to another town hall. Uh, you'll be able to present it Shark Tank style, and then we're going to announce the winners in our May Youth Conference. Um, but I think first step is to come to the town hall tomorrow, and I put the link in the chat. No problem. All right. So we're going to relaunch our um, our poll question to just get another sense of um, where everyone's at. So we're going to launch, it's going to be two minutes. Um, so if we can just take the poll. Um, you know, also guys, drop in the chat any questions you have for any of the panelists, for any of the panelists with Mar, Marcel or Katrina Peru. I, know I had asked you guys some questions earlier. But, you know, as I was sitting here listening to you guys, you know, retaining some of the information, I had some more that came to my head. Um, when you break out and do civic engagement and you're reaching to the community, do you ever think of, like, the long run in a sense, like your impact on that community or the togetherness that you're bringing or, Katrina, the students that you're bringing along to impact the next generation? Whichever. Yeah, I, um, I think uh, it was mentioned earlier, or maybe it wasn't, I'm not sure. That it's not, for me, it's not just a program that I'm designing, it's a movement. A movement meaning that it's not just going to die after, you know, uh, one, two, three, four cycles. Uh, Michael, you know this, you're, you're going through your fourth cycle of my program, you know? So it's like, once it's over, the idea is that you want kids to keep coming even if it's the same content, because they want to be a part of the movement. They want to be a part of the discussion. They want to be a part of the town hall meetings. Um, and, and, and for me, the movement has grown. You know, Michael, when I started with you uh, last year, April, we had six kids uh, remotely. <laughs> and then for the summer, that turned to 40 kids. And then for the fall, that turned to 60 kids. And then um, right now, we just started our next cycle of programs and we had like 80 kids sign up. Um, and on top of that, we weren't able to take, uh, we had to turn away work because we didn't have the capacity to take on more school contracts. And that's a movement when it's growing and it's growing and it's snowballing. Um, so for me, my, my goal is to, uh, like, like Eric Adams said, you know, it's about passing the torch uh, to plant seeds and every single young person that comes into our space so that they can be even greater than how we were, you know, and how we are. And I actually feel like you guys are already greater. There's things that you guys are doing. There's things that you guys know that I didn't even know at your age, you know? So you guys are, are, are way, way ahead, ahead of times. 
And as, as elders and as adults, we just need to get out your way, you know, give you the tools, give you guys the wisdom that we have, and then kind of clear the pathway for you guys to, uh, to move on. Because if we had all the answers, you wouldn't be going through what you're going through right now. So we obviously weren't able to solve all the problems. Um, so now it's on you, you know, you guys are the future. And um, I just want you guys to know that we're here for you if you need our help. And, um, and, and many of us are committed to that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I guess um, when it comes to my role specifically at GoodCo, right? It's responsible for a lot of the visuals that's put out there. And um, I make it very intentional the way we put our visuals out, right? Because when you look, look back out or when you look back at like Martin Luther King's pictures of his speeches and stuff like that in black and white, right? And it <laughs> wasn't that long ago, they had color in, in pictures. So um, definitely capturing, when I capture us, it's not just about us like having fun rides and being like, hey, look at us all on a bike, right? Um, it's about documenting moments in time and showing that through the lens of like, and, and having the, the future audience like in mind as like an audience that's gonna look back at this and be like, wow, this is what they were doing in, back in 2020. Um, and adapting to the appropriate mediums, right? So using Instagram, using um, different platforms, engaging young folk, folks, that's definitely a way that we consider like looking into the future of like how we want to be looked at, you know, 10 years from now. Um, cause I think when people see, when, when people can see themselves in, in a particular activity that would garner interest in it. Right. So if I see more black people on bikes, then I might pick, pick up a bike and, and engage in that activity as well, you know? And, um, Drew, who was our founder loves to use this example. Like when you Google the word cyclist, all you see is white men and, um, we're definitely trying to shift that narrative. Like the more we have content out there of people of color, young people on bikes and stuff like that, the more we should shift that narrative, you know? That's amazing. You know, you know, one of these days, cause I do live in Brooklyn and you know, I gotta give me myself a bike and come cycle. Absolutely. <laughs> Hope to see you this summer. Most definitely. Um, but you do have a ride coming up this summer, um, correct Mark? Yes, so we have our annual, now it's annual, Juneteenth Freedom Ride. Um, we'll be partnering with the Bur Burr President's Office again, and we're gonna do it even bigger this time around. I'm very excited about that. And, um, you know, stay tuned. I hope everyone on this uh, panel, you know, and in the audience ends up getting a bike and hope to see you guys this summer. It's gonna be a good time. Awesome. Well, um, we have come to the end of our program. Um, we want to thank you all for being with us today. Um, I did drop some, some um, useful links in the chat room where you can go and learn about who your elected officials are, your House of Representative, um, and, um, and just your local officials. Um, and as well as the, to register to vote, I dropped that link in there. And I am going to, if people are interested in volunteering, I'm dropping that link for you to go to volunteer match and, um, and you can type in what type of volunteer you're looking for and um, you, can, you can get it that way. And I encourage everyone to do that because it can match you with what type of volunteer opportunities you're looking for. So that's right here in the chat. One second, technical difficulties. We're, we're, yeah. So from the poll that we did and we, we, we dropped it twice just to see, um, just to see where people are. And, and again, some of the questions, um, as people say, it takes just a mo it just takes one thing to help you to get involved and you don't necessarily, you can do where you can, where you fit in, right? It doesn't, not everyone is built to protest and not everyone is gonna protest, but there are other ways that we can be civically involved that is helping our community um, to, to better themselves. And as I hope these three dynamic speakers tonight showed you that all it takes is, as we said, the faith of a mustard seed for us to just go out and, and try to be um, that effective change that we want to see 
and it's it's from anything from organizing the cleanup in your building or um, on the street because we do know that sanitation is far stretched right now and we do need to help at least I see a lot of it in Brooklyn that we need to help with um, some cleanups so um, and there's so one thing that I wanted to say or add uh, someone asked about the link for the town hall I just dropped it in the chat okay and um, and also, I just wanted to say one of the things I hear the most from our young people is like this uh, this sense of powerlessness, as if like nothing nothing I, I do is going to matter anyway. No one's going to listen. I don't have enough resources. It's like all these uh, excuses on, on why things can't change and why things won't change. And it's not your fault that you feel that way. Uh, that is actually a result of oppression. You know, uh, powerlessness is a symptom of oppression. Um, but once you kind of buy into the fact that you're powerless, then they win. You know, and uh, if you woke up this morning and you can breathe and um, you can move your body, you know, you have power, you know, you have power to make a difference and um, more power than you would ever know, you know, so I don't want you guys to ever think that you don't have power to make a difference because you do. Thank you for that. And um, thank you for being with us today, Katrina. And I look forward to part of your uh, meeting tomorrow. And Mark, I can't wait for when you drop the registration. So my first yeah. uh, Peace ride. Um, Michael, thank you so very much. You did an amazing job today. Um, you're amazing. So we can't wait to hear more from you. And thank you guys for tonight and look out more. We have actually our Wellness Wednesday series that we do. Um, and we're going to do it until the month of April. Um, so please look out. You can go to our website to look out for that. It's very useful information in terms of COVID, um, how we're moving forward in COVID. And we do have annual uh, monthly meetings to talk about um, uh, COVID as well. So look out for that for Brooklyn Borough President's office. And thank you for being with us tonight and enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.